Hey guys, this is Bruce. Welcome to Combo Courses Podcast. Every week we talk about GRC topics, cybersecurity topics, and from the it's from the perspective of somebody who's been in this field for quite some time. And um, I field questions about how to get in this field, how to stay in this field, how to upgrade, and also just how it works. Like how's what is GRC? What do you what what kinds of things you need to do? What those are some of the things that I talk about. And so this week is no different. So uh, I do want to talk a little bit about I want to address some of the comments that I've been getting on uh, on YouTube. So let me let me go ahead and set that up. Uh, it's I've been getting a lot more interaction from people I'm getting a lot more exposure um, than I'm used to. And um, just I, I have a full time job, so that's why sometimes I can't get I can't get to everybody's um, comments. I used to, I used to be a lot more interactive with people's comments, but if you're wondering why I haven't answered your questions, uh, that's the reason why. Is because I just get a lot more. I'm getting a lot more uh, engagement in email and in comments on all platforms. Just I'm getting a lot more engagement, and my job hasn't slowed down, and so that's what's going on. Um, before I jump into these questions here, I wonder if I have any questions on TikTok. A lot of times I'll have. A ton of questions on TikTok, and I'm getting nothing on TikTok. So I'm going to go ahead and answer some of these on YouTube. Okay. Got some new subscri- subscribers. That's cool. On YouTube. Um, somebody asked me, Bruce, do you have an LLC or are you now a 1099 contractor? So the answer to this question is... Uh, I work as a, um, I'm a f- full-time employee at a company. And uh, so the difference, is, so you guys know, the question he's ask, asking is what what you can do in this field, IT field or cybersecurity is you can have, you can work independently as an independent contractor where you have your own LLC or own business. And then you, um the hours are charged are, whenever you get paid, your business is getting paid rather than you. And the reason why some people do it that way is because if basically you're getting more money because they're not. You have to pay the taxes directly from your company to the government rather than rather than them doing it. So that's 1099. You're going to get paid more money. And if you're a full time employee, uh it's different. And there's pros and cons to each one of those things. So if if 1099 with an LLC or S Corp or whatever company you have working directly with another company is like a B2B business. So some of the pros is that you make more money because they're giving you your entire money and they're not taxing it. They're just giving you the money. You do the work for the hours and then they pay you. Um that's the cons. I mean, one of the pros is that you, you make more money. Uh, another thing is that you get a little bit more freedom because you're working out your hours with them because they're treating you like a business. So you you're it's a lot more flexible when you do that. I've done I've done both. It's a little bit more flexible. They pay you more. Um, and you're kind of a they understand that you might take on other work, too. Because you're just they're just billing you per hour. So you you might have this this business that you're working with and this other business and this other business. And you could actually hire people. So it's actually way more scalable because you could hire people under your business and then have them help you out with that work or whatever. It depends on what kind of relationship you have with that company. So that that's those are the benefits that you could scale it. You make more money and you're way more flexible with hours and stuff with full time employees employee, your uh, the benefits are that the company is going to take care of all the back end stuff, all the HR department stuff. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. They're just paying you a check. You're not worried as much about the taxes because they're taking care of that. And they, they have all these extra benefits. A larger company or medium sized company might have they're going to usually have more. Um, a larger company is going to have sometimes more access to things like medical, dental, vision, stuff like that. They'll have like these big 
deals with these other healthcare companies uh, or these other financial companies that do a gigantic 401ks. And, and then sometimes they'll give you stocks and stuff. So all the benefits that you get from that company uh, are, are definitely a pro. Now, let's talk about cons. A 1099, the cons are if you're doing independent contract work and it's B2B, you have your own business and your your business is is actually doing GRC or IT work with them or whatever you're doing. You can This also applies to, to taxes and, and HR. All of those you can do 1099 with, depending on your comp, your your relationship with that company. Um, I would say the, the pros is that you have to do all the back end work. So number one, finding companies that will do 1099. Uh, that can be they're out there, but to have a good deal with them, that's going to that's challenging. It's a little bit more challenging than finding like an employee type situation that's that's more stable. 1099 is not stable at all. Um, another thing is you have to handle all your your health care, dental care, all that stuff, which you can do now. You could have your own LLC or your S Corp or whatever, and it has its own. Uh, you can have its it, it can have its own um, medical, dental, and all that kind of vision, all that kind of stuff. Taxes is another one. So you, at the end of the year, have to pay your taxes. On your, so that means you gotta have, have to do all your own accounting and making sure that like everything's above board. Uh, especially if you're trying to be scalable, it's way better if you do everything the right way. Because if you're trying to hire people and things like that, it just gets super complicated. Not to say you can't do it. You totally can do that. But it's just going to get way more complicated. You might have to hire a whole nother person or people to help you out to manage it. Because it just gets super, especially if you're talking about other uh, hiring other people to do s certain things because then you got a payroll and all that kind of stuff. So those are the cons of doing a 1099. Uh, the, the cons, the bad things about an employee is that they it doesn't pay as much. Uh, you, you're subject to whatever laws that they have in their culture. So you have to fit in, which could be a good or bad thing. But the bad part of that is that you got to do what they say, period. <laughs> I mean, you you have to do what they tell you to do. And um, you are you have to fit into their culture. Um, bad things about being an employee versus a 1099. Um, you can get lulled into a false sense of security because even though 1099 is, is way more volatile, you can it, there's a fault. There's a you might have a false perception that you're more secure in your employee uh, position and that that. It depends on the company you're working with. So I would say those are the pros and cons. Overall, having done both, I prefer I prefer being an employee uh, until I do have the reason why I like being an employee is because I can do my own. Uh, I, I do stuff outside of IT work. So I for IT, I like being an employee. But for my other stuff, I don't want to do employee stuff at all with that stuff. So I keep those two things separate. For, so for me personally, I can see how a person would like a 1099 better. But for IT and cybersecurity, I personally like being an employee better because I'm trying to use this as a stepping stone to do something else I want to do. And so that thing that's something else has nothing to do with companies. I do That's my own company. It's my own thing. And I kind of just keep the two separate. So, so that's kind of... Uh, those are the pros and cons. So they asked me a question and the question is, what do I do? Um, I am, I'm just going to go ahead and answer them real quick. I am an employee, but I do some contract work on the side and have a separate LLC. That's what I do. And uh, that, that's been working for me so far. If it stops working, you know, maybe one day, one of these days I'll go full blown, do more 1099. Maybe I just didn't do it right. Uh, I'm not opposed to doing more 1099 contracting work. Okay, let me answer some more questions. I don't have any questions on TikTok and that, that might be because 
I'm doing TikTok in a different way. Let me see if I can uh, access TikTok. It might be this new format. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, let me see here. Let me go to... I'm not seeing... Uh, I apologize, guys. I'm not seeing... I'm not seeing anything from uh, <laughs> from TikTok, so I can't answer questions. All right, so I'm gonna keep keep going with uh, with YouTube. Um, okay, here we go. Here's a good question. A question I can answer. Somebody asked me. Thank you for your excellent presentation. Quick question. Um, does every organization require a top secret clearance? for an ISSO role? Um, No. No, they don't. No. And let me explain why. So this is a misconception that all cybersecurity, RGRC positions in an ISSO is an information system security officer. And that's a GRC person for the federal government. And no, they don't all need a top secret or secret clearance. Case in point, right now, the organization I work for, three level, it's a three letter organization, federal government, US, and I don't have, it doesn't require a top secret clearance or a secret clearance. They do require what's called a public trust and they do like a background. And that's technically not, um, not a clearance. Um, sometimes it's kind of pulled into the clearance world, but it's actually not a clearance. They just do a very thorough background check on you with that one. So, uh, no, not all positions require a, a top secret or a secret clearance. And uh, I don't I think most of them will at least have a public trust clearance, um, a public trust background check. I'm, I'm sure all of them have some sort of background check. And the reason why is because cybersecurity, you're being entrusted with uh, with protection of the, you know, some of their secrets, their proprietary information. You're you're being tr- entrusted with with uh, access to some of the inner sensitive information, proprietary information. So they do need to make sure that you're that you can be trusted. So there's some level of of assurance that has to be done with uh, with cybersecurity, and there's just no way around it. So let me just say here. Let me just go ahead and say um, no. Um, not all require a public trust. I mean, a um, TS or secret. Most, I would say all, all require some sort of background check. most need public trust public trust and i i think to get a ts no for sure to get a ts in the sei you're gonna have to be a u.s citizen for those all right let me see if i have any more questions here Can you share your YouTube link in your channel? Okay, yeah, I can do that. Let me see. You want to get to my YouTube channel? It's going to be... Give me a second here. Give me one second. Got so much... I got a lot of stuff going on here. (laughs) YouTube.com forward slash... How are you doing this these days? At combo courses. There we go. At combo courses. That's the way to get to me. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to answer some more questions here on YouTube. 
and I apologize. I, normally, I'm, I get so many questions on TikTok, and I don't know what's going on with it. I'm not seeing any. I can't see um, anything that's happening. I don't, I don't know what, what's going on or what I'm doing wrong or whatever. But the best way to answer, ask me questions right now is if you really have a question that you need answered is to go to YouTube, go to Facebook. I'm on all platforms. Okay, I'm seeing them now. Okay, I apologize, guys. I see them now. Um, TikTok says, uh, are there any projects I can create for GRC as a college graduate, which can put me, what I, which I can put on my resume? Um, you could, um, let me think. I haven't thought about that one. Um, what things will help you out? For ticked for uh, for college graduate for a GRC project that you could put on your resume. One thing would be to if you could write a security policy. Here's one thing you can do. Um, go to your school, whatever school you're at, and uh, look at their security policy. Look at their check out their security policy. And then do a security upgrade, update their security policy form. Whatever they have going on, update their security policy. Their security policy should be based off of some, some kind of framework or standard. It might be ISO 27001. Um, it might be uh, NIST 800. It might be NIST uh, cybersecurity framework. It might be... Um, CIS controls, whatever it's based off of, you can update it and then present it to the staff. You could probably put something like that on your resume. Um, whether or not the college uses it, you know, they might not use it, but you could totally put that on your resume that you wrote a cybersecurity uh, policy for for the college. And then if you get asked about that on your resume, just tell them, tell them what happened. You know, I, I created, I updated you could tell them the truth. Like I updated their, I up, I took the took it over myself to update their, uh, their security cybersecurity policy, and I did it in accordance with uh, ISO twenty seven thousand and and one twenty twenty two, and um, uh, and then I presented it to the staff. I gave it to the staff, and they were you know they were impressed by it. That's what you could. That's one thing you could do. Another thing. What else could you do as a GRC person? Um, GRC. There's tons of stuff you could do for IT work, but GRC is mostly governance, which is management type stuff. Risk. The R is the risk, and then C is compliance. So in one of those areas is what we're focused on. So another thing you could do for risk. A, taking a risk-based approach for the GRC would be to run a scan on their network. If they have wireless, which most colleges do on a campus or one of the sites of their campus, run a wireless scan, use some of the tools, and get do a, a proper assessment of their network. And if you find anything, uh, write up a like an assessment report. Do a risk assessment report based off of their wireless network and find all of the issues with their wireless. Maybe the wireless uh, has a rogue access point that looks exactly like Texas AM AM or something, but it's not the actual. It's a it's a rogue access point. You could point that out. You could uh, you could do you could um, you probably find things like uh, if they're not using the proper or if they're not using strong enough encryption on their wireless network, if they, um, what else? Um, if they, um, maybe they're not reaching parts of the campus, um, find a bunch of, do a, a complete risk an analysis of their network, put a report together on everything you find, and then give it to them. Now, <laughs> that's one thing that you could put on your resume. Um, and then, if they use what you said, like if you sit down with the IT department and they use what you said, that's actually pretty huge. Especially if you find something really nice. If you find some real cool stuff on once you're do, doing an assessment on their network 
And I'm not telling you to hack their network. I'm not. I'm telling you to be passive, just because there, there's no law against scanning their network. But in, now, if you try to infiltrate the network once you find holes or whatever, that's that's different. <laughs> but if you do, just can do a scan as a part of a project, you can put that on your resume. And then here's the thing about the the projects that I just mentioned: doing a cybersecurity uh, risk assessment of their of of all the security on their campus doing a wireless assessment on their campus doing uh doing a security policy rewriting the security policy and presenting it to them the thing is it's not intrusive so you're not you know you I'm not telling you to do anything intrusive I'm just telling you write a report and present it while you're doing it you're going to learn uh frameworks it, like you're going to have to look at a framework or a standard such as NIST CSF or CIS version V8 or ISO 27001, you're going to have to learn that in order to put that stuff together. And then wireless scanning, if you actually conducted this non-intrusive wireless scan, you would actually have to learn that what to do, what tools to use, how you have to have a whole technique of doing it. And then you probably find all this Bluetooth stuff. So you're going to, you're going to actually learn as you do it and you'll be able to put that stuff on your resume. So those are a couple of things you can do. Another thing you can do as a college student for projects is, is to start your own practice. Like you could, if you're good enough, you could actually create your own company and be a freelancer and do, and do stuff for local agencies. That's another thing you can do. Now, what I would recommend you do as a college person is to start like with with any IT. Any IT is going to help you. Right. Any IT. So student work programs for IT in the IT department on the school campus before you graduate even or after you whatever apprenticeships, internships. They usually have some sort of some kind of programs that that work with local business and stuff. That's another thing you can do. Any kind of IT is going to help you out when you're a beginner because companies, what they really want is experience. And so that's any kind of legit experience you can put on your resume is going to really be helpful. And you said, I'm learning about FISMA compliance at the moment and uh, also looking in, um, into internships. Yeah. So FISMA is federal government. And so one of the things you can do or what I would recommend you do is to um, is to look into internships with the government because they have a ton of them. They have a lot. I mean, every now and then they're sending me the Department of uh, who who sent it to me. Uh, Department of State has sent me a couple of things about intern internships and uh, apprenticeships. And um, government's always looking for people because the thing is they have a whole bunch of people who are kind of retiring right now. A uh, whole bunch of people who are getting out of who are getting out of this work, a bunch of boomers, a bunch of people who are parents are, are retiring. They're getting out of it. So we're we're always struggling for people. So the government, which is FISMA, that's what you're doing now. And don't a lot of people think uh, government is just DOD or military. It's not. So it's you got so many different federal agencies and they all they kind of behave differently. So. For example, if you work in Na I worked in NASA. NASA is they move totally different than the Department of Defense, of which I work for as well. Um, and then you've got who else? You've got uh, Department of Agriculture. You've got Department of Interior, um, FBI. You've got you know intelligence organizations. Um, they all move different from one another, but they all kind of use FISMA. So they, they, because they have to, it's mandated that they have to use FISMA. So the more you know about FISMA, the better. And then FISMA, uh, their main publication is the NIST 800 series. So that's another good one to, to learn. So FISMA is about what government mandates, what federal organizations do, but NIST 837, and 853 tell them what to do, what they're supposed to do. So what's what the government agencies are doing right now is they'll take NIST 837, NIST 853, and they're tailoring it to fit their organization. Like they don't use all the controls. They'll use 
uh, any controls that that fit to what they need to do, for example. So I hope that helps you out. Let me I want to keep going through some of my questions from uh, YouTube because I don't want to ignore people here. Let me see here. Somebody said. Uh, This one, I have to read context. Get into IT, but not super technical. Oh, okay, so I did this video where I talked about getting into IT, but not being super technical, which is kind of what I've been doing the last few years doing uh, GRC type work. Because what I was saying in there is that all, all cybersecurity, all information security is not super hands-on. I know because that's what I've been doing for the last you know, 10 years, non-technical type work. That said, I still need to know how computers work, but I'm just saying like there's there's a whole bunch of jobs that are are in that are adjacent or aligned with or actually in cybersecurity that you don't have to be on the computer uh, configuring stuff. And I and I mentioned project management and I mentioned GRC type work. Not some of it is technical, but a lot of it is not like their policy officers and things like that are not hands-on technical, but we do have to know something about computers. All right. So her question is, or comment is, um, this is the route that I took. I'm not super technical, but I do know some things. I recently graduated from uh, WGU with my master's in information technology management. And, um, and that includes the CA, CAPM certification as part of a curriculum. The PMP is next. Oh, PMP is fire, by the way. Uh, that's a very good it's a project management certification that that pays and i'm thinking i i want to try to get a security plus cert very good cert very marketable and i'm aiming for the grc sector due to my healthcare experience in dealing with hipaa and laboratory compliance clia wow she's my my girl's doing exactly what you're supposed to do like this is ex this is I couldn't have given better advice than this, especially with her background and everything she's doing. This is this perfect. She's making the perfect moves. So number one, she's getting her degree from a, a accredited college. Great, great move. Great move. Because and I'm not saying you everybody absolutely has to get a degree, but it's just more competitive. Like not only is it going to put you above. Uh, it give you more opportunities above somebody else who doesn't have a degree, but um, but also it's 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 going to give you time to build up a network of people who are going to go out and get jobs, going to go get apprenticeships and internships, and and you start to meet people who are going to be in this field for a long time. So that's also a really great thing about it. And once you get in, it pays you way better to get a, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or even an associate's degree. You're just going to get paid better without having to rely 100 percent on certifications. And certifications are, are great, but degrees are better. That's just facts. Um, and it depends. I mean, there are some high level certifications like a CISSP or a, I don't know, a C. Uh, CCNP or CCIE or something like professional level high e expert level search that are better than than some degrees that than most degrees I would say but with experience way better but not everybody is can get to that level you know what I mean because even the CISSP it you're supposed to have five years of experience before you even start taking the test so and the other one, CCNP and CCIE and some of the other high level, super high level certifications, they I mean, you might as well just go to school. You might as well just go to college. It's easier to go to college than to get some of these certifications. I'm not even bullshitting you. OK, so um, another thing she's doing right is that stood out to me is aiming for the GRC with her background in HIPAA. So she's using all of the experience. She all, This is what I always tell people to do. Start where you are. She's using her background. She already has a background in, as a, in healthcare, and she's building off of that background to get into GRC because it aligns perfectly with what she's doing. With, with her background, she'd be able, she should be able to get into fields like um, pharma. Pharma has a huge need for people like us, GRC-type people, who can point them in the right direction and secure their systems 
and but also make sure that they're in line with the with the as business essential functions that they ha have to do, right? Protecting patient information, uh, making sure that their systems that are uh, dealing with um, with uh, with with proprietary patents for for drugs are protected, things like that. So um, she can get into GXP. Like she probably fit right into GXP for for pharma and uh, laboratory compliance. That's another thing she mentioned. Perfect way. Like start where you are, wherever you happen to be, whether in retail, retail has has its own type of security. Uh, whether you're in uh, manufacturing, whether you're in the government already, especially vets. Uh, if you're in in uh, the financial sector, all those se you might be able to use the experience you already have to position yourself into a higher level, higher paying, more stable IT or GRC type position. OK, let me see here. What else do we have? I did this video about the Kia challenge. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that, but. This this video this is is I wouldn't say it was quite viral, but it's almost got a million uh, views. I mean, I think it's half a million by now. It's a little over half a million. I don't know, but all I did was comment on uh, on what what it was. You know, some people are hot wiring Kia's because Kia has some kind of real bad flaw on it. That one in in Hyundai's. Okay, let me see. Let's see if I have any more comments on. All right, let me see here. No more comments here. Um, another comment on D Truth says, okay, what is this video? Get a different job. Okay. So somebody commented on this one uh, where they were saying, um, let me show my screen here on YouTube. Somebody was saying that how stressful their job was on this video and uh, how abusive this the organization and the, the people or the client was or something like that. And they were stressed out every day. And my response was to get another job. Because... Our job as cybersecurity people, a lot, of, one thing is not mentioned is how stressful it can get uh, working with these organizations who've been breached or insider threats, or it can be stressful. Like my, I myself do, I do get some stress. Like my main stress comes from, we don't have enough people to do the work and they will not hire more people, or I guess they're hiring people, but the vetting process takes four months or whatever. So it's just that's been my difficulty, but also secondary to that would be dealing with difficult people in the organization, customers, peers, managers, managers sometimes can be the worst, like managers who are dealing with them who can't communicate well or um, or just not people. Uh, uh, they're not. They're in a management position, but they don't know how to deal with people. They don't have emotional intelligence. And I have to deal with them. I have to talk to them. I have to interact with them. I have to be in line with what they're doing and everything. That is very difficult. And so this person in this video was saying that she's dealing with this and doesn't know what to do. And it's just, just stressed out. And if you get to this point, I think it's time to leave. Like if you get to a point where, and I'm not telling you to just give up as soon as you meet your first asshole, you know, <laughs> I'm not saying that. Because this that's it kind of comes with the territory of this job. You're gonna have to deal with people who are difficult. You're gonna have to learn how to speak uh their language and it does get stressful. But if it's if it's abusive and you find yourself having anxiety, which is what happened in this video here, she talks, um I, that I responded to in this comment, uh is I think it's just time to go. And I've I've found myself in this situation before. And just you don't have to deal with this, especially if you're in cybersecurity, you can get a job, right? It might take you a, a, a while to find a job that's comparable to the kind of pay or comfort level that you have at that job or with the right benefits or whatever. But just take your time. Keep your job. 
right? And then just start working on finding another job, right? That that's that's what my my uh, recommendation to her was. And somebody else commented on this. D Truth says, uh, "I'm currently in a similar situation. Go government contract uh, that I'm currently on the leadership. I'm currently on the leadership is incompetent, impatient, unprofessional, demanding." and has been verbally abusive in the past. And uh, I have committed myself to finish the project that's currently in place. Once the project is current, is complete, I plan to move on. And uh, always remember that our skill set is always in demand. So there's there are jobs out there and there is just about it. It's just about picking the right one for you. Man, this is this. He's, this man is speaking truth to power like this is what i'm talking about it's exactly my attitude my next job i will be interviewing them as much as they're interviewing me man beautifully said man d truth he comes on here all the time him and i talk all the time on comments i hope maybe one day he can jump on here with me and um, also offer advice always always uh has great advice here but i want to talk about this one because this is a good one um this is a good one so Cybersecurity can be very, very stressful. But there's a difference between the normal daily stress of maybe you you have there's a too much work to do, or um, you have to deal you you have to learn to communicate with the difficult C, CSO CISO or a difficult CIO, or maybe there's a manager that's a little you know a little snippy sometimes, or people. People getting their feelings about a breach or about whatever's happening. That I think that that's understandable, right? That's reasonable. But sometimes I've been in organizations, and it's it's not the whole. Typically, it's not the whole organization. Usually, it's not everybody. It's usually one or two people in the chain of command who who are just stirring the pot. They shouldn't be leaders. But they've gotten to the leadership role by just attrition, like they just stayed long enough for everybody else to leave and they make everybody else's life a living hell. And then you can usually tell because people are in and out. People are just in and out, in and out, in and out. People don't stay there. That's how that's a telltale sign. It's one of the first questions you should ask on interviews, because that is a telltale sign that something is not right, whether it's the culture or they're allowing a few people to just run wild um, or the leadership is just running everybody off a cliff. I've been in all those situations and usually it's like, usually it's in the chain of command and there's like, it's either an upper level manager or a mid tier manager because peers, you can kind of deal with them, right? You, you, you work with them when you have to, right? You, you, you work with them and then it's done or whatever, but if you have a manager that's in a place of power and they're directing everybody and you have to deal with them, there's, there's no way around it. It's like uh, the agents in the matrix. Uh, when Morpheus said um, they, they, they hold all the keys, they they're guarding all the doors. And so that means that, and someday at some point we have to, we're going to have to face them. And that's what happens with these managers who are just Man, it's different things. It's sometimes it's, it's con incompetence. Sometimes uh, they're power crazy and they want to just assert their dominance over everybody. So they talk down and disrespect people, write meetings or on email, blast it out to everyone. Or sometimes they just they're very poor with communication. It's not that they're stupid. It's not that they're tyrants uh, on purpose. They're just really bad with communicating and how they got there is because of their talent, their IT talent, or they just they just been there so long that they just kept leveling up slowly over time. And, you know, so these people in the chain of command is where it really messes things up. It causes chaos. It causes people to have anxiety. It causes a, a large amount of turnover where people are coming in and out and in and out. And you can't get people longer than about two years there and then they're out because they just can't take it anymore. Uh, and they're good people, like especially when you have good people leaving. 
That's a telltale sign. Something's not right. Uh, so whenever you do an interview with when you find your new job, make sure you ask them that question. Like, what's the turnover rate? How many people have been in this position in the last four years, five years? And if if they don't have a very good reason why why five people have quit in five years, it should tell you something. Or if they start laughing, here's how you know. <laughs> here's, here's how you know. What happens is in the meeting, you'll ask them, you'll be in the in the interview, right? And you say, well, they'll say, hey, well, do you have any questions for us? You know, great interview. Um, Sounds like a good fit, but we'll see. Do you have questions for us, right, at the, at the end? Uh, and then you ask that question. Like, I'm sure you're going to ask about travel. You know, you'll ask about, like, working, working. Uh, what are the shifts like? What, you know, what? where's the office, whatever, those kind of questions. But make sure you ask this question. What is the turnover rate for this position? How many people in the last five to six years have been in this position? And if they start laughing, like, oh, 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 you know, and then they, <laughs> that's what they do. And then they're like, oh, yeah, you know, it's we've had a few people leave. Right. Like we just keep people. People keep leaving out of here, but they usually go on another position, blah, blah, blah. They stay within our company, but they go somewhere else. It's telling you that something's not right with that particular position. And they're trying they've had to replace it several times because. The managing, the managers are assholes or uh, they're very dominate, domineering and very disrespectful to workers or they just don't know how to communicate correctly or it's a customer like we have to. They're they're making hundreds of millions of dollars from this customer, so they can't drop them. But the the, the representative who you have to deal with for that customer is just an asshole. Uh, it just just mean spirited, doesn't know how to handle stress at all just attacks you, uh, treats you like a little kid, patronizing. Uh, that stuff happens, man. I mean, and I, I would say if it gets too bad, um, if you're in that position, just start looking for another job. There's tons of jobs, just like D-Truth says in this comment over here. Um, there's tons of other jobs. Just go to another job and, and move on. Move on with your life. Um, you're not going to have no problem finding another job. It might take some time for you to find the one you want. And then if you're in the interview, make sure you ask that question. How many people have been in this position? Like how what's what's it been? What's it been like the shift work? So that's a very good question. All right. Let me see if I have any more questions here. That's a great question from D-Truth. Um, daily tasks of an ISO. Somebody said, listening to you, it sounds like it's very easy to transition from a CPSO to an ISSO, uh, especially since I have taught computer background, a self-taught computer background, working on getting a security plus anything else I should focus on. Well, I don't know what a CPSO is, so let me see what this is. Let me see what a CPSO is real quick. That is a, well, there's different kinds of CPSOs, so I don't know. Um, I don't know what a CPSO is, so I can't answer this question. <laughs> Anybody else know what a CPSO is? Uh, let me see. I guess I could ask him, what is a CPSO? What is a CPSO? Mm -hmm. All right, let me see. What else do we have here? And I'm just, if you guys are joining late, all I'm doing today is just answering questions from mainly from YouTube. Because I've been neglecting it lately. But if you have any questions whatsoever, feel free to ask. Let me see. This one is... Hmm. This is about me installing one of my floodlights. 
in my house. I did about a year ago, and then years before that. Okay, this one is just thumbs up on that one. TLS does not help with a X uh, cross side scripting attack. Oh, okay, <laughs> my bad. <laughs> I should shut up when it comes to technical stuff, huh? <laughs> I think I I created a what was this one? Oh, okay, I I uh, I did this free. I did a video where I was just breaking down. Was this the one where I did poems, plan of action, and milestones? I don't remember. I was talking about controls for 853, and then I might have mentioned cross-site scripting as an example, and then I said TLS, and he says TLS does not help with cross-site scripting attacks. That's my bad. Okay, what's this? Um, SSCP compared to Security Plus, 8140 baseline certifications. I think I was talking about the IT field. And he says, somebody said, it's too competitive gatekeeper field. Hiring managers throw half the stack of resumes away just like that. They watch texts with work. They want texts with work experiences. They want internal transfers. Search don't get you in. Not what you know, it's who you know. Okay, I disagree with this. Um, I disagree with this statement. Um, it doesn't, it's, it's too... What do I think about this statement? Hmm. I disagree. Uh, it is competitive. Some of it makes sense. It is a competitive field. Um, but I, I would say it's worth it. It is competitive, but it's worth it. Um, they, they throw half the stack of resumes away. And I would argue the reason why they throw resumes away is because us IT people, most of IT and cybersecurity people don't know how to, don't know what to put on our resume. Um, I would say a resume is a very poor indication of who and what you are and what you've done. Um, the best we can do is put the most applicable IT experience to the job you're trying to fit into. And the way you do that, there's some tricks that you can use to do that. And I just, I'm the reason why I say this is because I'm constantly getting contacted. Um, I'm constantly getting contacted with, with different opportunities for IT and cybersecurity, Con like constantly every day I'm getting emails, I'm getting people messaging me on LinkedIn, I'm getting, it's not a coincidence, right? It's not, it's definitely not my looks. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's my resume. So I know what to put on there and it's very targeted. That resume is very, very targeted. My profile, very, very targeted. And the reason, the way I did it was I looked at the market. The market has certain demands. So what I'm saying is make your resume, make your profile and your resume, your presence online look like where you're trying to fit in. Like for me, I'm trying to get GRC positions. So most of the cybersecurity risk positions, security policy positions, people are hitting me up about those jobs because I put it on my resume. That's I know that that's in demand. I know that that's what they want. So I put all the key words and key phrases that they want to see there. I mean, I actually have that experience as well. That's that's very important. But there's ways you could put it on there with little uh, with little experience or even just the skill set for that. No experience, but the skill set. You got to get it on your resume, though. You got to ask yourself, what does this field want? Whatever field you're trying to get in, whether it's a, if you're a network engineer, they there's a specific thing the employers want from a network engineer at different tiers now. Like you might have 
architects, they're looking for certain certain things. If you're if you're trying to be an architect, they're looking for a certain kind of skill set and knowledge base for a network architect. Uh, if you're um, an intermediate person like who knows Juniper really well, there's certain specific things and tools and devices that you got to put on your resume. Same thing with um, network administrators and junior level network people. There's certain things that they're looking for. How do you find those keywords and phrases? How to how do you get in the way of all that opportunity? The way you do it is find people who are already in the way of those opportunities. Here's how you do it. You can go to LinkedIn. I'll show you. Very few people uh, listen to this part of my little speeches. <laughs> Very, I'm always shocked how, how few people listen to this little part. Uh, and it's kind of the most, it's, I mean, if you're trying to get in this field, it's, it's pretty, it's, it's going to help you out quite a bit. And let me just, I got a lot of people uh, jumping on my LinkedIn right now. So let me just shut some of this stuff down. But here, here's what it looks like. I'm, I'm on LinkedIn right here. All right. So let's say you you want to get in the way of opportunity of people doing GRC for PCI compliance. Now, GRC is very broad field. So let's focus on retail retail. I know that retail IT uses a lot of um, uh, P, what's called PCI compliance. Now, let's say you didn't even know that. Let's say you were just looking for any GRC. OK, so let's just let's start broad and work our way down. GR, let's just type in GRC. Now, here's one thing you can do to find to try to get in the way of all the opportunity that's happening right now. We're going to look at jobs. Keywords and jobs and see what they're looking for. And we're going to look at other people's resumes. Let's start off with jobs. So let me make this screen a little bit bigger for people who's following me on. On YouTube. OK, so let's look at jobs first. GR, all I did was type in GRC because let's say. You don't know a lot about GRC and you just you're trying to get in. You don't know. You don't have no idea what the keywords are. So first thing we're going to notice is that it's pretty broad. I mean, GRC is all over the place. You'll notice this in many different industries. SAIC is a global security company. They, they compete with people like Lockheed Martin, um, Northrop Grumman, um, places like that. I used to work for SAIC. It was a pretty good company when I worked there. Um, and then you've got. Other GRC positions such as CW, uh, CDW. I don't know how much GRC, uh, how much government work they do. And you've got banks. Look at this. You've got a bank here. You got Terminix. Look at this. They they're looking for a GRC an analyst at Terminix. So right away we're seeing that GRC is across all fields. Our next question should be: Well, I want to go into whatever field like i'm trying to i'm not trying to be in terminix i'm not trying to be in the government maybe i want to be in the banking sector because i have a banking background so let's look at that let's look at this one right here this is from regional banks in alabama and we're not trying to work at this place all we're trying to do is some 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 ops we're just trying to do some um analysis here um so let's look at this so what kinds of jobs do they have here? What I'm really interested in is what are the responsibilities of this job? Primary responsibilities. Okay, job is a risk liaison partner. This might not even be what we're what we're looking for. Let's see. Serves as a connection between business and risk management. This might not be IT related. Yeah, this I don't think this is IT related. So let's say we wanted to get into this now right away. They're not they're not using a lot of the same phrases that we would need for IT. Or are they? Let me see. Um, CIA, CRM, Six Sigma. This looks more like a no, it seems like there is some IT stuff here. I'm seeing PMP in here. Or is that Six Sigma certifications? Not quite what we're looking for. Not quite what we're looking for. Um it does have some technical stuff in there, but not quite. So let's say GRC for we're trying to narrow down our search by a certain thing. So let's say GRC banking. 
We're starting broad, and then we're going to whittle this down so we can get keywords here. All right. I'm seeing HR department. I'm seeing human resources. I'm seeing a lot of human resources stuff. So maybe when they're thinking GRC and the banking sector, they're thinking HR departments, I guess. I don't know. That's weird. Let's look for... Let's do an even broader search for this. Let's go to Google and then type in GRC Bank. GRC Banking Industry. Let's just check this out. GRC. All right. So this company is breaking down what GRC is, their GRC program. We're doing some recon on GRC in the banking and financial sector. So let's 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 start even broader in this field. We started with GRC, now we're narrowing it down to just banks, but maybe that's a little bit too specific. Let's say financial sector. We want to know the keywords. We want to know what what kinds of jobs are there. What what positions, what roles do they have? What do they do? Uh, what kind of equipment do they did they use? What kind of skill sets do they typically talk about? All right, so GRC for the financial sector, governance, risk, and compliance for the financial sector. And here's a little article that's breaking down what they're looking for in GRC in the financial sector. See if I can pick up on anything, um, any kind of keywords here. And nothing's nothing's really popping out at me right now. So let's keep looking. Let's look for when I just kind of go through a couple of these articles to see if anything pops out. For governance, risk and compliance. Okay, now this one's breaking down what's going on. Okay, here we go. Here we go. It's talking about what things does the financial sector look for in GRC? Um, risk governance, uh, financial, operational, and IT, IT risk management, audit and control activities, compliance. All right, now you're talking. Let's see, the impact of getting attacked. So it's definitely super important in the banking sector. They're talking about different attacks that have happened at different firms. That's great, great information. So we want to read as much as possible in this field. If you're serious about this, you've got to know something about this field. Now, you, if you're in the financial sector, you probably already know what keywords to look for, right? I'm, I'm not super heavy on financial sector, so I don't really know. Um, let's look through this here. Uh, no, this is not going to help us. Let's try this. Jobs. I'm on Google and I just typed in G uh, GRC financial jobs. I want to get some job titles and I'm, and I'm seeing a few here. Check this out. IT governance, risk and compliance as a senior analyst. Cybersecurity GRC for Banner Health. And this is um, one of the things it's doing is that it's looking in my my local area. So I want to expand my search. So now I'm seeing oh SAP GRC roles and for um, I, from financial sectors in Colorado and Kansas. So now I'm getting some at least some roles. Regulatory risk and analyst. What do they do? Let me see. So we're getting closer here. I'm, I'm gathering more and more information on what kinds of things that I need. And look at this. They have a ton of uh, they've got scrum master jobs. They've got uh, project manager jobs in the financial sector. There's a lot of overlap between all the sectors, to be honest with you. So you're always going to have some kind of program or project managers. You're going to have leads in IT. You're going to have you're going to have certain roles in every sector. But we're, what we're looking for is like keywords for this particular sector. 
And this is one way you can do it is looking at jobs and job titles in that sector. So that's kind of what I'm doing right now. And I'm seeing a couple uh, I'm seeing compliance, audits and enterprise risk approach within the SEC, the regulated businesses. So I'm seeing some keywords here. But this is mostly for um, financial risk advisors. So that's not what we want. Um, cybersecurity GRC at financial trust. OK, here we go. What, is, what are these guys looking for? So they're looking for. You get the idea, right? Like, look at this. Here you go right here. So th here are all the frameworks that they're looking for. They want you to be fluent in some of these frameworks. Maintain and understand uh, an understanding of technology related to federal regulations, industry, federal industry standards such as FFIEC, CRI profile, NIST, CSF, NIST 800, COBIT, ISO. That's 27,001 PCI compliance stuff. So they want you to know when it's one of these things. And if you go through this, you'll start to pick up those kinds of keywords. So now you have an idea of what employers are looking for. Now what you can do is go to what people are putting on the resume. Why this is important is because on LinkedIn, a lot of job aggregators don't do this. One of the unique and awesome things about LinkedIn is it shows other people's resumes. So you can kind of get an idea of your competition with LinkedIn. And make no mistake about it, these some of these people are going to be competing for the same job. The great thing about this is some people put their entire resume and, and pro, their, their resume and their entire work history on, on their profile. And that's I do, too, as a matter of fact, because they're trying to look for jobs. They're looking for like minded people. So you would go through this list and find people with those resumes for the financial sector, if that's what you were looking for. They mentioned things like information security, uh, information system security association. Now, this is something you could join for free. You could join this organization. You can go check it out for free. I think they have some kind of membership fee once per year or whatever. But you can actually join this thing. Um, and then you could look at this person's experience. Look at the keywords they have. Now, notice this. Look at this keyword. F-F-I-E-C. Now, the first thing you should be asking yourself is, what the hell is that? Maybe I should know what that is if I'm trying to be an, a, a GRC person in the financial sector. Because this guy is a GRC person in the financial sector, or at least has worked in the financial sector. So that's kind of what you need to do as far as research, to get yourself in the way of all the opportunity that's happening. Because it's it, make no mistake, it is happening in real time. And I know that the economy, you know, is not has been not been doing as well or whatever. But cybersecurity is still hot. Like I'm still getting opportunities. People contacting me and all kinds of stuff. Uh, let me see. Somebody said I need to whittle down to cyber. Um, getting tons of network jobs. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, I, I get a lot of, uh, oh man, uh, for a while I, I was getting a lot of um, project management type opportunities and uh, that's not really my wheelhouse, you know, so um, that's not, that's not where I shine at. So I kind of, you know, you, if you have to tighten your resume in a certain way, then that's what you have to do, you know, make it more in line with what you're actually doing. Another one that I used to get a lot was um, being a seam engineer because that's what I did that for a couple of years. And so I would get I, to this day, I still get opportunities for being a seam engineer, but I haven't touched the seam in a long time. So it's been four or five years now. So, I mean, I still work with them. I still work with them, but not as an engineer, not building them from scratch, which is what I used to do. So. I, while I could probably make content for it and I know what to look for as far as audit logs, I don't build them anymore, but I still get people contacting me about that. So you got to tighten your resume to go in a specific direction. And the great thing is you could have multiple resumes out there if you want, if you have multiple skill sets. 
Yeah, so I disagree with this one. I, I went on a real huge tangent on that one. <laughs> Uh, let me see if I can answer some more questions. And I'll keep this one short. It looks like I don't have as many people jumping on uh, today, probably because of Super Bowl or something tomorrow. I don't know. But uh, let me see here. More questions for people on YouTube. Uh, let me see here. What's this question coming from? GRC cap preparation. And somebody said, somebody was asking, oh man, this thing just, all right, this is going crazy here. Is it a red flag? Is it a red flag? Um, if a role I'm interviewing for is for both ISO and ISSM work, um, it could be a couple of things because this kind of happened to me in the last time with this current job that I have that kind of happened to me. I went into the interview and I had to interview three times and, um, the First guy who interviewed me was just a screener. They just did. They don't know. All they know is what the client is asking them. So they kind of like read a list and the list is kind of a catch all. Like it was, it was just a really broad list of things. And it didn't tell me anything really about the job. Once I passed the screening and it's not really an interview, it's just them asking you some questions from a third party organization, who's not has nothing to do with the actual organization. But once they vet you, they say, okay, we're going to set up a meeting with this some manager, some uh, some hiring manager. So I went and talked to the hiring manager and uh, they asked me very broad questions as well. Like I still didn't really know what I was going to do. I knew I was going to be an ISO. That's that's all I knew. I didn't know the details yet. Right. I didn't really know. And then the third interview happened. I got past the second interview. And the third interview was a little confusing because they kind of did me like like you're talking about. They asked me about like two jobs and I didn't know it. But until the question, some of them, I nailed them. And then some of them, I was like, what? <laughs> so some of the questions were for an ISO. So those ones, I was nailing those questions, nailing because I, I just done it so long. But then they start asking me like cloud engineering questions. And I started getting worried because I'm not a cloud engineer, right? I don't know. I don't know how to set up cloud from scratch. And then I don't know. He was asking me very technical AWS cloud questions, right? So I'm like, I don't know that information. Most of my exposure for cloud came from FedRAMP, where I'm making sure that federal organizations are compliant with risk management framework using FedRAMP. That's my exposure to cloud. Have I gotten cloud systems um, accredited before? Yes. Have I done uh, been a part of risk assessments for cloud systems? Yes. Have I set up systems? No, I haven't. But I would love to be in that. This is what I said. I said, I would love to know more. And I'm, I'm looking forward to jumping in there to do some cloud engineering. Was I really? I mean, I, I was trying to get this job right. So um, kind of, I would, I would definitely would have been interested in a job where I was doing more cloud so I could learn it and get that under my belt. So I wasn't completely lying, <laughs> but I, I was thought it was an ISO position. So, and I didn't want to blow it. So, um, anyway, come to find out, like when I actually talked to people who were on the ground, like I was actually, I finally got an interview with the actual technical people. I found out they were actually looking for two different positions. There was one position that was kind of a cloud engineering type. They would have to have a cloud engineering skill set. And that's why he was asking me those questions. And then there was another position, the ISO position, which I got. And so he was this guy, the this upper level manager was merging two different things together. And I, I think maybe he was trying to figure out where I was going to be. He was trying to figure out whether I would be 
in in an isse is what they call it at this organization or an isso and so that's why he was asking me both questions so it, it wasn't a red flag it was more like they were trying to figure out where to put me i i think looking back at everything that they asked me seeing the big picture and, and now knowing how the organization works they were trying to see where to put me uh so it might have been it might be confusion on the interviewers uh, part and you could flat out ask them like is this an iso position or is this an issm position like i i was under the impression that was an iso position you should definitely ask them that because remember you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you so make sure and then make sure you ask them that critical question in the last five years how much turnover has there been because that right there might reveal a red flag. If there's a lot of turnover, it's a red flag. That means something's going on. If they if they don't want to tell you how much travel you do, that's also a red flag. Because that means it's a lot. Um, because if it's low, they tell you very quickly. <laughs> if it's a low, they're they're not going to hold back on that. But if it's a lot, they're like, well. Um, they basically told me it's three systems and I have to operate as an ism and an iso and it's a one-man show oh man yeah that's kind of a red flag because they're trying to put two hats on you it could be it could be a red flag um reason why i say that is because um one of the things that happens in cybersecurity is they don't have enough people to do all this work so a lot of times they'll have us doing two and three different jobs. Um, and I think it's a couple things happening. Number one, companies are greedy, so they want to hire one person and have them do three different jobs. Um, and another thing that's happened is they can't find enough people to do the work. So one thing you could ask them is try to get an idea of how many hours, how many hours a week, because Really, it might not matter if if you have, depending on the workload, it might not matter that they're dual hatting you, that they're putting two hats on you. Um, it might not matter. So you want to figure that one out. Like you can ask them some like roundabout questions about how much is it shift work? Is it is it eight hour shifts? Does how many people work extra hours to get the work done? Are people pulling extra? extra time to get work done ask them questions like that you know and you want you want them to know hey i'm a hard worker but you're trying to gauge like how much actual work there is because my problem with being dual hatted is that they're trying to put too much on my plate and i don't have enough hours in a week to do all the stuff they want to do meanwhile the customer's expecting all this stuff so i get in front of the customer and they're like asking me stuff that i'm like I'm only supposed to do X, Y, and Z, but you guys want me to do the whole alphabet. And I and I have to <laughs> figure out how I'm going to navigate that. That kind of stuff happens. So scope creep, where you're in your job description, they're saying you're going to do these three, four, five things. But then when you get to the customer, they're expecting an, an entire book worth of stuff. That does happen a lot. That's happened to me quite a bit, actually. Um, and, and I would say before you take the position or one of the things you should ask about is see if, uh, oh, they already told you it's an ISO, ISO and an ISSO role. So, um, maybe, maybe ask questions about the hours and then how much response, what are you responsible for? Are you managing people as an ISM? Like, that's one thing, because I've been in a role where I was kind of an ISM and kind of an ISSO, but I wasn't managing anybody. It was just me. And if I did, if I was managing people, it was people who were con third party contractors who were helping me. Like they I could push some of the workload on them. Like I, I needed to do like a spreadsheet. The government wanted me to do some spreadsheet. And then I'd say, hey, could you guys. Could you guys go ahead and handle this? And then they would do it. And then I would look at their work and say, well, could you fix this and that? And then that I wasn't managing them like that. Like I would I wasn't their supervisor. They were just helping me to do the work. So 
and you said, uh, no, I'm not managing anyone, but then, then there might not be a problem. Because the, the real work of an ISM is where they're managing three or four different ISSOs. But it might mean that what they want you to do is you're going to be hot talking to higher level leadership because that's another ISSMs. One of the things they do is they hot, they talk to higher level leadership. That means like C-level execs or like generals or colonels or something like like high level people. Um, that's one of the jobs they have to do. Um, and then another thing that they're doing is managing ISSOs who are underneath them. Those are like the main two jobs you see them do. They might do other stuff. They might help create the contracting uh, documents to rebid for a contract or they might there might be some other things that they do. But those two main things, they're talking to upper level managers and they normally have people underneath them. But if you're not doing if you're not actually managing people, then that shouldn't be too bad. But I, I would definitely ask, interview them more on that. Like, how much responsibility do you have as an ISM? What is your ISM's responsibilities? And what are your ISSO responsibilities? That's what you should ask them right there. That'll, that'll nail them. Okay, let me see if I have any other questions here. Any comments, any engagement, anything going on? I have been going through my my questions until something happened with my okay there there we go let's go here i'm on the back end of my um comments so that's what you're looking at here on the screen if you happen to be on TikTok. these are my comments from uh youtube Let me see here. Oh, this is a great comment. Somebody talked about the difference between SSCP compared to Security Plus. And they said, yeah, this is a really good comment. David Petrell says uh, this, the, SSCP um, is about half the CISSP, and the Security Plus is about 30% of the CISSP. Now, I've taken the Security Plus. I have Security Plus and I have a CISSP. I do not have an SSCP, but I would say that that's about right. For a Security Plus, it's, it's a percentage, but also the questions are different. Like the types of questions that they ask you on the Security Plus – is very different. And that's what makes CISSP hard. Is that the CISSP asks like comprehensive situational questions. Like if you change the situation, it's a different answer. Where Security Plus is pretty straightforward. You know, like the difference between a, a, a private IP and a public IP and what are the security issues between those two things. Something like that, like straightforward. Um, it it de it really it depends, but the security plus questions are way more straightforward, I would say. And this the SSC well CISP questions are very very. Uh, it's like a paragraph. You're reading the paragraph, and then your responses are a paragraph. So sort of comprehensive type questions. And I think that's it, guys. I'm going to let this one go. Uh, I'm not going to go too too long. Uh, let me know if you like this format. Um, this is a little bit different. Doesn't seems like uh, don't get as much engagement on TikTok when I do this, this style of showing my screen directly like this using TikTok Studio. But we'll see. We'll, we'll just try and stuff out. Um, that's it, guys. Thank you. Uh, let me see. Somebody said, could you please mentor me? I'm, uh, I'm a final year BS. I, you know, I don't have time to mentor these days. Um, I just don't have time to do it. Um, I, I have a full-time job and so I just don't have time, but what you could do is subscribe, um, ask me questions. If you buy my course, any question you have, I'll do my very best to to answer direct questions from you that's one of the benefits of actually getting my courses if you have any questions at all i will 
I always, especially to students, I take my time to to answer directly. Uh, not just do videos, but like questions that might be like something you can't really put on a video or in a comment online. You could ask me those questions. So I've got free courses. Um, I've got uh, some some courses that uh, are reasonable. I've got uh, a ton of books that you can read. I've got some um, some some great content here on YouTube, on TikTok, on Facebook. And you're taking the security, the ISS, you're taking the ISC2 uh, cy uh, certified cybersecurity in a few months. Can I get those links? Okay, no problem. Not a problem. Okay, first one I'm going to give you is the one to my YouTube channel. And it is youtube.com or slash at convo courses. Hopefully that link works. Is it backslash or forward slash forward slash? And then it's um, the best way to find those courses is convo courses.net got lots of free stuff downloadables um paid my paid stuff is if you if like i said you pay for that stuff i feel obligated to answer directly to my students like any kind of questions you have i'll do my best to answer those questions um let me see if there's any other things here that i could show you that are good for you to get into. Let me see. The other one would be my books on Amazon. Let me show you those. That's more of a cost effective approach. If you're interested in that. Let me see if I can find that. So I've written uh, quite a few books that talk about the stuff I'm talking about. It focuses on um, all the stuff that I talk about here on these on these channels here, and. Um, it's everything from cybersecurity fundamentals to deeper dives into NIST 800, which is my specialty. I'm, I'm working on some other stuff that might be extremely helpful uh, to people who follow me here. And um, I'm having a hard time finding my, my author's, author's page. <laughs> So bear with me. Combo courses. Yeah, I was doing mentorships for a while. Uh, just I found that I just don't have time to do it. I got to choose. I have to choose my time wisely. And um, and that's kind of what I've been doing. <clears throat> Bruce Brown. Amazon. There we go. my last link guys thank you guys for watching every week really appreciate it there's my link to all the books if you're interested in that you guys take care
All right. I just uh, logged off of uh, TikTok. <laughs> All right, guys. Take care. Thank you for watching. I appreciate everybody. Um, I'll see you guys next week.